Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the sixth concurrent session of INGET 2021. Uh, in this session, um, Mili Saha will be presenting Bangladeshi teachers' practices and perceptions of technology use in ELT classrooms. The floor is yours, Mili. Thank you so much. Uh, as you heard, I'm Mili Saha. I'm from Bangladesh and uh, I'm an uh, FC professor of English here. I work at a public university in Dhaka. That's the capital city of the country. And as you know, uh, I studied second language education uh, uh, in both Dhaka and Toronto. And last year I came back from Canada. And after that, I have been uh, studying uh, particularly the online learning and um, online language learning since, since during the COVID situation and it has been an emergency learning process. So my today's presentation topic is Bangladeshi teachers practices and perceptions of technology use in ELT classrooms. Although I uh, wanted to see the uh, general features of using technology in the classrooms, but um, definitely uh, since the teachers have some experiences uh, during this COVID situation and online learning. So those have also uh, been combined with, uh, with the physical classrooms. And so I will look at uh, the uh, features of both online class and physical classrooms. So to introduce my research, I uh, just uh, want to uh, uh, focus on some uh, uh, recent literature and the findings that really uh, connect to my research framework and the uh, uh, findings and other uh, Characteristics that we have been looking at the results. So that technology has uh, profoundly been impacted. And that's very recent research that English language pedagogy is by making learning exciting and uh, motivating. And our learners also uh, give this feedback um, most of the time. And despite facilitating communications and critical thinking, um, integrating technology can reduce social um, interaction and reach us in the classroom. That, so that is the or side of using technology that uh, you might have less interactions. But sometimes teachers say uh, that learners usually have uh, more interactions with the content and material that are shown through technology. So that's uh, other types of interactions that we have to take care of. And the final research that I'm going to present uh, that fixing some clear objectives uh, by the teachers uh, must be aware of classrooms and technologies limitations and affordances. So we have to count both the limitations and the affordances while we are using technology in the language classroom. Uh, but uh, when while I was going through the uh, recent uh, findings uh, in the local context, so I found that none of the research uh, uh, really is focusing on learners or teachers' perceptions. I mean, uh, they didn't attempt to hear their voice and uh, Usually there was a statistical analysis of teachers' attitudes that exposed the challenges of using ICT in the local classrooms. So that's a very common research. So I, I wanted to hear their voice and I wanted to talk to them uh, the way they uh, perceive and the way they uh, feel technology should be integrated in the classroom. So the theoretical framework that support my research um, are also uh, very recent and basing on the findings uh, that when we use technology like in mobile or computer, usually listening skills and vocabulary learning are quite um, facilitated in the classroom. And definitely technology cannot be ignored in the language classroom nowadays, even in the rural area of such a developing country like Bangladesh, uh, because teachers are our students are also aware of that. So teachers have to be um, faster than students to get it integrated in the classroom in learning and in education or in teaching uh, because they want, students want teacher know about technology and they teach them in turn. So uh, the model, the technology acceptance model and the theory that supports uh, my research and findings is the TAM or the technology acceptance model by Davis. And although the theory is quite old, but I found when I was talking to them, uh, I found them they have um, multiple factors uh, that is influencing their perceptions and practices about technology and um, integrating it inside the classroom. So they do have, they are talking about culture, culture and change and their own beliefs and attitudes towards technology. And at the same time, the teaching styles that they usually follow. Uh, which are often impacted by the previous and in-service training that they receive. Uh, and I found in my uh, findings that there is an uneven flow of acceptance and rejection and at the same time um, uh, low preferences and intermediate preferences or high um, preferences or acceptance in problem solving or other uh, instructional purposes. Um, so why did I pick this research? And as a researcher, uh, since I found no research uh, in the local, uh, done in the local context to address teachers' beliefs and practices about using uh, computers or the internet in uh, teaching English, um, and there was no qualitative framework actually um, 
representing teachers voices or learners voices even so um my research explores and identifies the uh, current practices and perceptions of Bangladeshi teachers technology use and that effects in the ELT classrooms. So definitely we look at the physical classrooms and online classrooms uh, perceptions and it analyzes teachers actions, benefits and challenges um, in using internet for the teaching and learning that language. So the research questions include what are Bangladeshi EFL and ESL teachers attitudes towards using technology in language teaching. And secondly, I wanted to see how do they integrate technology into uh, language teaching practices and what are the perceived effects, benefits and challenges that they report uh, about using technology in, in the language classrooms. So the uh, methodology and the framework that I used, as I say, it was qualitative and participants were 10 EFL teachers working at different elementary and high schools, uh, both in rural and urban areas. And the tools uh, used were some structured interviews and those were taken online and recorded for analyzing later. And the analysis uh, was uh, mainly thematic and content analysis. So with the help of ground theory methods and other um, other descriptive analysis. So to look at the urban teacher um, teachers' responses regarding using technology, uh, we see the, uh, the these respondents actually uh, are quite positive about using computers and uh, the internet in language teaching. And no matter it is online or physical classrooms, as he states, I feel most comfortable while using technology for such topics requiring many correspondences. So some particular topics actually uh, he focused on to sh should be taught through internet or uh, multimedia and writing outlining or um, some posting on the whiteboard look tedious and time wasting um, and i prefer google classroom for some subject matters where i can use the internet resources easily but there are some things in english i prefer to teach in class with both whiteboard and multimedia so they do have a neutral attitude like they are not completely um, dealing for uh, using internet every day or for every classes um, but he doesn't use his computer in every class and instead he avails the opportunity only once or twice a week and he helps it helps to narrate or explain using examples in teaching grammar that uh, follow questions so mainly for explanation and he believes that testing comprehension on multimedia save uh, the, those pen and paper use and um, uh, students can answer instantly from the screen as they find it quite beneficial um, and more interactions with the content and the technology makes the learners more uh, concentrated and more the class is more manageable. So as he said, I mainly use digital contents, pictures and text in addition to YouTube documentaries and lectures. So those are the things that are uh, uh, limited in technology use in the classroom. And he's, he says his when I was asking about the environment and the resources available for uh, technology support in the classroom, he said his school provides the multimedia and internet, but no computers and he has to carry a laptop and which is often forgotten and thus uh, time constant is another matter because the class is only 45 to 50 minutes uh, long and he believes uh, setting up the laptop and multimedia and other things takes more than 10 minutes and, and then he uh, doesn't feel much motivated to um, uh, utilize technology uh, at the cost of so much time and uh, that might harm to uh, cover the curricula and the learning objectives that uh, they have in mind for each class. So as he said, we didn't receive any special TPAC training on how to utilize technology for language teaching pedagogies, although we have had some training on preparing and administering classes and tests online during the COVID-19 period. Uh, before that, I would never know about Google Forms or classes. Uh, however, it's a must now. So there is a combination between COVID-19 um, experience and uh, the pre-COVID-19 uh, situation or context experience. So uh, they didn't have enough uh, training to integrate uh, technology into the language pedagogies that they usually practice. The other urban teachers say technology use is quite fruitful. He believes this is pretty helpful, but, uh, but he uh, is also neutral about using this and frequently, and he has not that force or motivation to get it in, in classes mandatorily. So although he said, firstly, it attracts students' attention, and many of them are not aware of using technology in language classroom, besides their textbooks and uh, lectures. So those are traditionally believed the sources of learning. Uh, hence, it raises learner motivation, and the class is easily managed. They quietly try learning. 
So that's good for managing the class, but some topics are not properly described or exemplified in the text. And I need some additional materials or supplementary teaching from YouTube uh, to provide us as uh, hand notes. And especially when many students ask about the correct pronunciation and accents, they can discover their language potential using technology. So we find the uh, valid, um, I mean, these findings basically coincide with international findings that we already discussed in the theoretical framework that for teaching speaking and listening, uh, technology is quite helpful, uh, but he hardly uses a computer room like once a month and the computer is not built in in his classroom. Uh, so he would use it more frequently online, uh, although he mainly uses uh, a pronunciation dictionary to make the learners understand the monotone or the diphthongs and he needs translation apps or Google translation translator for finding necessary vocabularies. So he recommends and provides YouTube links for various learning purposes. And that's all. Once again, they are with limited use. And, and these challenges he faced, he uh, reports uh, various reasons of being not interested in using technologies include the non-supportive or uninspiring environment, like other teachers are not much motivated to use technology at the same time, and unavailability of the internet or computers in the class, curricular pressure, etc. And if many of us do, I would be motivated to do the same. So environment also matters and uh, like they should be uh, peer motivated uh, to use technology and to integrate it. And the third teacher, uh, I believe the teachers definitely uh, uh, need to focus on all four skills since this is communicative language teachings, but since they do have limited use of technology and they do not find the CDs, listening CDs uh, included in the text and that's why uh, they cannot use it, although they feel learners need it. And he said, we do have a multimedia projector and a computer in the lab, of which the government provides. Unfortunately, we are not motivated enough to utilize this. So this is not the lack of resource, actually. This is lack of teacher agency and teachers' motivation, although they do have power. So despite having trained many teachers about practicing computer-assisted teaching, neither the young trained teachers take the lead to bring a change. So. Thus, there is no environmental support and, and a push or uh, uh, monitoring or evaluation that whether they are really utilizing the resources provided by the government or provided by the authorities. So technology means all about conducting online classes according to this teacher, and he would never use technology before um, getting through the COVID-19 situation and emergency teaching uh, processes, and they neither have the uh, call arrangement in the physical classes nor TPAC training. So training is another issue that has been repeatedly uh, uh, reported in the research. Curricula have a significant impact on such reluctance or resistance for technology. English is usually taught as a subject to pass and not as a language to learn. So everyone considers the grade and pass rate, not the learners, communicative and technology skills needs. So teacher agency motivation matters in urban area and they're quite they do have resources in hand, but they are not much motivated or even trained or they don't feel that uh, we must use it and we need to utilize these resources given to us. Uh, so to look at the rural teachers' uh, perceptions and practices, that's a bit different. And uh, teachers are usually highly optimistic about the results of using technology because they do not have this in hand always. And he uses, so this teacher uses computers uh, in every two classes out of three every day. So that's more frequent than the, even the urban teachers. And he said, I believe using digital content helps me provide the right and adequate input. The presentation is good and learners remain centered on the teaching topic. They do not gossip or talk among themselves and become interested in learning. So again, concentration matters and they can use the internet in a limited way. Usually they, they just uh, use it to, to show digital content or uh, other audiovisual materials like cartoon or uh, songs or rhymes and we need to take help from the internet and i think content development is the biggest part of using technology in language teaching in these remote schools i prepare my content but everyone cannot do it uh, besides we get various uh, powerpoint slides from the ict ambassador in every sub district education office i usually use youtube teachers government uh, bd i mean those are the websites provided by the teachers and and bloom to prepare books and lectures so i use different video editing software to get it 
get ready to use in the class say uh, from .NET. Besides, I use MS Office and Photoshop in addition to PowerPoint slides. So these rural teachers even are have extended use than uh, compared to the uh, urban teachers that I really didn't expect. And uh, his school has two computers, but one multimedia, which are inadequate for all the teachers. They do have one laptop, projector, and multimedia. Again, again, a limited resource, and they receive ICT training on developing um, and using technology to feed the classroom pedagogies. Uh, yep, Anil. Oh, you have five minutes left. I, as I mentioned, I will going to inform you about the five minutes left. That's why I raised my hand. Sorry. Uh, yep. Okay, it's okay. So his school has two computers, as he said, but he said limited supplies are not the biggest barrier. So this is a turn, but technophobia is the worst issue. Almost 90% of the teachers are unaware and ignoring training. So that's again, uh, agency and power. So they do not have uh, technology-based uh, learning experiences and are, uh, they are technophobic. So this technophobia could be uh, reduced and removed uh, through um, monitoring and motivating and giving a frequent and lots of trainings and they did. So TPAC training could raise teacher awareness about choosing pedagogy effective content. So the teachers are almost giving uh, similar uh, information like this. Uh, second teacher says we do have an ILC lab and e-learning depository design, uh, designed by the Maoshi, that is the government uh, website and uh, government authority. So the education board authority, but we do not have computers or multimedia in the classes and they do not move to the ICT room uh, because that's the uh, time constant matters and staff uh, uh, limitations are there who will fix the classroom and the multimedia in the classroom. So that was a problem. And uh, he also said many rural teachers do not have technical skills and experiences, neither have they had adequate training. So my working environment and social conditions are not supportive of doing that. And I regret not using technology. I'm also quite unaware. So they need everything actually. They need uh, resources, training, and awareness. So the last participants, as we asked her uh, whether they really use it or find it quite meaningful, uh, using technology and she explains since rural parents often fail to afford necessary books and other resources using multimedia is a must to ensure equal access to teachable content and classroom learning so that's another important uh, to fight uh, inequity issues we need technology that could um, uh, make um, equality and equity inside the classroom and access to the materials and learning things so it is a crucial diversity issue we can address using technology also right pronunciations native speaker lectures games and so played on computer can change the course outcome with learning in the present setting. So that is another uh, crucial point. And she also said learning from computer screens can increase the students shared learning and peer communications and transformation through learner content interactions. Students are more collaborative since they share resources from a similar source. So uh, other other focus is that um, uh, transforming the classes and uh, active learning and, and problem solving tasks through a technology. So that is a new site that I discovered. And these participants have some specific suggestions to develop the situation. Like they said, availability of uh, technical resources and teachers uh, to raising teachers' interest and um, motivation through uh, giving training and uh, creating positive environment and supporting uh, logistic supports and teacher pressure with time and literacy should be reduced at the same time and they need TPAC training particularly to understand how to use technology effectively uh, to the English language pedagogy. The other point they uh, come up with is that many of the teachers are reluctant to transfer new learning. So uh, training transfer should be motivated. They do have training and resources, but they are not using. So monitoring is needed. And finally, they say appointing young, trained, and technology-oriented teachers and administrator will change the overall conservative atmosphere in the non-native language learning context and in the rural context. So so to sum up the research, I want uh, I want to say that uh, they, they have definitely they have the differences in attitudes towards the technology between the rural and learner teachers, and as we see. Uh, uh, the technology is overall inadequately used in the Bangladeshi LT classrooms, both in uh, rural and urban areas. And definitely it might happen in other Asian contexts and other uh, underdeveloped countries and other uh, contexts at the same time. So I, I, the conclusion really calls for a striking balance between technology integration and teachers' instructional responsibility. And they should be aware of that, that they need technology and learners want technology. So that's important. And they need, uh, they need computer and learners want computer. So there should be a balance between this and different pedagogical challenges in the uh, foreign language classrooms so that are really burdened with many challenges, uh, obviously. And these are the references that I used for my presentation. 
And that's all from me today. And thank you everyone for hearing me if you have any questions. Thank you, Mili. Thank you so much. That was very informative. Thank you. Um, and if the participants, attendees have questions, they can share through the chat box. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your findings with us and inform, uh, informing us about the, your practices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, too. It was nice to see you all. It's nice to have you, too. Thank you. And the floor is yours. OK, I'll begin. OK, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ilknur Eginni, and here I have uh, my colleague, uh, Mehdi Sorhin, uh, from Medipol University. Uh, we're going to present our uh, one, of, uh, one of papers, one of our papers actually published recently on um, teaching practicum. So I appreciate you all being here today with us. I'm sorry that I, uh, I maybe my, uh, my 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 face is not too close to the the, the camera because I'm in the uh, in the school, so uh, we have to deal with it, with it this way. Hopefully, the, the you know I, I'm glad at least the um, the equipment here and the uh, classroom is cooperating, so I can talk and you can hear me clearly. Let me know if, if there's any audio issue, audio or visual issues. Um, okay. We can hear you clearly, Ocha. It's all good? Okay. All right. So our, um, the title of our presentation is the impact of practicum on pre-service EFL teachers' self-efficacy beliefs. And we believe that that's the first step into professionalism. Um, we both work in the um, Department of English Language Teaching Program. Uh, and here in our program, we teach uh, pre-service teachers um, and as you know, they all, uh, after, in Turkey, after they all graduate, they will be eligible to, to work in a public school system um, after, you know, completing certain, certain requirements. Um, we have been always, you know, wondering about the, the, the impact of practicum uh, that our students do in the, in the last year, senior year. Um, uh, as, as, as majority of the, I guess, you know, senior year students do in, in Turkey. So, um, and we ran this uh, study together. Uh, so I'm just gonna go over, would you, would you um, next slide please? So the, the kind of uh, stages we're gonna go, the outline of the presentation is that I'm gonna begin with an introduction. Hojam, um, can you? The slide is not moving now. Can you hit the next slide, please? So I'll begin with an introduction and then the purpose of the study. And we'll go with the literature review, the methods, the analysis, the results, and the implications. Um, so the, so I, I want to talk a little bit about the, 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 the importance of uh, practical training and practicum in the teacher education programs. Um, as, as we all know how important to move from uh, um, theory to practice, this, um, this field, uh, practicum field has been actually studied for a long time. And in the majority of the times, a lot of teacher education programs actually around the world uh, definitely felt the need of, of providing extended terms of practical training for, for teachers believing in that you know there is this is a great opportunity for basically teachers to be teachers to um to gain valuable experience in the classroom in the real classroom setting so um and they they, they get also um the uh, the benefit from reflecting on their own learning their teaching expertise and learning from the experienced teachers, basically the, the, the mentor teachers or the lead teachers in, in, the, in the schools they visit, they learn from them. Um, and they 
the, eventually by the end of the, the, the term, the practical experience, they, they make some kind of assumptions, predictions about how um, that the working environment for them will look like and how they will perform. So this, this is some kind of a consensus, like an overall consensus in the, in the field of um, English language teaching uh, from the perspective of, of practicum. Um, uh, yes, I don't. So what's interesting when we look at, you know, a, a lot of uh, uh, em empirical, basically em empirical studies, um, it, it seems like the pre-service teachers have this, you know, preconceived ideas about their ability. So that it's kind of like they are, um, like Jensen and Borg says, their pr profession and abilities are set in their minds before they um, actively go in the field and, and begin um, like rehearsing their, their, their teaching. So we have some uh, obviously predisposed you know, ideas. Uh, we all have. Um, and for, for pre-service teachers, this is more of like when they are taking their, um, their major uh, classes, they think about themselves, you know, they value uh, the importance of education and how they need to perform in the classrooms. Um, and they think that maybe I can do this, I cannot do this. So they think about how they, how effective they can be, but, um, and maybe they, they come to some kind of a conclusion in their mind. So they have some kind of preconceived ideas about their abilities. And this could be also, this period can be, um, can be seen as, as a, a very constructive period, period, meaning that like there, this is, this is the time that they can make changes in their mindset and they can move forward. Um, and, and we also, you know, uh, looked at, you know, of course, like set up studies and, and, and we wanted to, um, we wanted to believe, I mean, like as researchers, as like, we wanted to believe that this, this could be a, you know, kind of a, a, a step in the door of professionalism. So they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna see what the what the professional teaching you know will look like. Um, so the we can go on further. As as uh, the next slide, I jump. Um, the so one of the things that I, I, I uh, saying actually I really like from the the American philosopher um, Dewey. You know John Dewey. We do. Um, he says that we do not. We do not actually learn from experience, but we learn from reflecting on our experiences. So the, the, this time of the period in their life is, 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 a, is, is extremely valuable and they need to think about what they believe in, like they need to evaluate their own beliefs. Um, so the, a, a lot of the literature review, you know, come to some kind of a consensus on that teachers make changes in their personal beliefs. So they do, they do get a chance to reflect on, uh, uh, on what they can do, what they believe that they can do in this time of the period. So, and on the other hand, there are some studies, like uh, I'm looking at this, you know, Yin's, the ones we, one of the studies we stated in there, Yin's 2019, uh, the researcher looked at the pre-service EFL teachers' readiness to teach, readiness to teach in a four-week practicum in a secondary school um, during a semester teacher training methodology course enhanced pre-service teachers' content knowledge by bridging the gap between theory and practice. So there was some improvement in their understanding of how to practice their uh, teaching methodology, but What's interesting in that uh, study is that they did not feel very confident about their communication skills. So, so this, this and like some other, you know, like the, uh, um, the other studies you're gonna see in the following slide is that we come across with some kind of conflicting actually um, results of some studies. Uh, saying that like the, maybe there is not much change in the in the teachers beliefs maybe there is but there's I mean they all believe in that I mean a lot of studies come to uh, 
conclusion that's saying that it's, it's a, definitely a valuable experience for them. Um, so because of these conflicting results, we wanted to specifically look at what happens in our, in our case, you know, in here in Turkey, what is, you know, what, what is it, what is it, what kind of a situation the, the students find themselves after the fact? So it's the pre and post, uh, the, their beliefs uh, be prior um, to their uh, teaching practicum and, and after the teaching practicum. So one of the other things I want to mention in here, um, yeah, so if you got, uh, thanks. So one of the variables we use, of course, I mean, since we're talking about the, the beliefs, it's the teacher self-efficacy. So we're, we want to look at specifically teacher self-efficacy beliefs, um, how much they believe in, in themselves to make changes in their, in their actions. So there is, um, I mean, in, in the academic uh, circle here, sometimes there is a misunderstanding about uh, what teacher efficacy really mean. Uh, and some researchers or some people um, use confidence and teacher efficacy interchangeably. And I believe that, that teacher efficacy is, is, um, is significantly different than, than, what, uh, than, than someone having confidence in doing something. And the, the, the very difference in here is that um, the way we define is the Titian and Morin et al. And that's the one I, I use as an operational definition in here that, so it's the, they define teacher efficacy um, is as the extent to which a teacher feels confident to control events that affect them. So they, it, it is more, much, or of, much more of that how much they believe in themselves to make changes in the environment um, uh, in, in whatever context they are in. So the, the, there is a, some kind of a, like a um, change, they have a change agent role under, under their teacher efficacy belief. So that's, that's I think, very important uh, to talk about. So when we make the difference, you know, like, saying that teacher, I'm confident in, in teaching, you know, middle school students. It's not that, it's like how, you know, how efficacious you feel. Um, so we wanted to, uh, I, I mean, as, as you go in more depth of the theory, the, the teacher efficacy beliefs come, come from the Banduras theory, social cognitive theory, but um, the researchers here, Tishan and Moran, in Wolfolk Hoy um, looked at teacher efficacies uh, from, from three different subcategories. So that's what we wanted to include as, as opposed to many other studies, just looking at um, personal and general self-efficacy, but we wanted to look at these three phases of efficacy, uh, phases of context where the self-efficacy um, shows itself. Okay, so actually, yeah, I'm just going to directly start with the methodology. So, and uh, as Iknoja said, actually, in our study, we investigated the, the pre service EFL teacher self efficacy beliefs before and after the practicum. So, it was a kind of, you know, and uh, pre and post test. So, the study, we registered a questionnaire so to a group of students, and they were two pre service teachers uh, studying actually at at a university in Turkey. So, and um, yeah, I don't want to just talk about the instrument because of the time. So we used actually uh, the teacher efficacy scale. Uh, so, and uh, we focus on, you know, uh, student engagement, self-efficacy for classroom management and self-efficacy for instructional uh, strategies. Okay. Uh, just a moment. So yeah, I, I'm just passing the reliability of this scale. So according, uh, actually, for, in order to answer the first research question, we, uh, you know, and we made uh, a null hypothesis. So uh, we, we actually tried to just find out whether uh, 
and uh, just being, you know, the, the student's perception of before and after the practicum changes uh, or not. So, and uh, in so doing, uh, we, we, we ran uh, a paired, you know, and samples t-test. So according to the findings of this study for the first hypothesis, uh, so the students actually, and uh, there was a difference between the perception of the students, but in order to just uh, clarify what the difference is, is it positive or negative? So I'm talking about the direction of the difference. Uh, we actually, and uh, we need to just uh, look at the, uh, the hypothesis test summary. And according to the results, and 27 of the students actually indicated a positive, you know, difference. So while eight of them indicated negative difference, so but the uh, so but the difference was uh, meaningful, statistically meaningful. So the first null hypothesis was rejected. When it comes to the second one, we looked at the, the actually the, the students' self-efficacy in applying instructional strategies, whether there's a difference between the participants, you know, on pre-test and post-test scores, you know, obtained from the scale that we uh, administered. Uh, the, the second actually, and so hypothesis, I mean, null hypothesis was also, uh, you know, and uh, rejected. So indicating that there was a difference between the, the perception of these students at the beginning, at the end of the, uh, the practicum period. When we look at the, uh, just a moment, we're just trying to change the slides, but yeah. When we look at the actually continuous field information, uh, I mean, in the, the graph here, so we, we can see that 27 of the students indicated so positive difference, while five, uh, not a significant difference. But in total, uh, the, the, there was a statistically significant difference between uh, the perception of these students and before and after the practicum. Uh, so when it comes to the third one, and we have got one more, you know, and uh, variable here that's the classroom management so uh, similar to the first two hypotheses i mean null hypotheses so uh, there was also a statistically significant difference between uh, the, the the perception of the students so yeah you can find the details here we can actually share the the powerpoint presentation with the uh, with the actually with the people who would like to look at through the details because of lack of time i have to just skip over some pages uh, so in general, actually, and uh, it indicates the importance of, uh, you know, and uh, the, the practicum and how it can influence the way the instructors, uh, you know, and have got, you know, uh, the classroom engagement, and, you know, and uh, or using stra instructional strategies. Uh, so, uh, so we cannot actually, and, uh, you know, and ignore the importance of practicum, but how effective that is conducted at schools, yeah, it's, that's, a, <laughs> that's out of the zone of this study. Uh, it's a different topic. So uh, when it comes to the findings, uh, just a moment. So the findings are aligned with the studies indicating the positive and instructional you know, impact of the practicum experience, as Iknujo talked about, and how it can influence uh, the, the way they perceive and the, the, the practice of teaching. So, uh, so teacher self-efficacy beliefs on their profession can positively change. Uh, again, and uh, we've got some other studies indicating the importance of uh, you know, and uh, the, the, the practicum. So uh, the present actually study and again uh, relied on the, the quantitative approach to gain in-depth understanding of the impact of the practicum. But uh, when it comes to so some suggestions for the future studies, maybe, and uh, some actually and a mixed, you know, and a mixed method can be conducted with some uh, with, with in, interviewing the, you know, the participants, so to, so to just, you know, uh, to strengthen the results of the study, because we, we particularly focused on the quantitative, you know, approach to, uh, to gain the, the, the uh, to gather actually data. So the findings are echoed in uh, Josh Kun Hoja's actually, and the study as well, that the preserve CFL teachers uh, believe long with the issues uh, that they face in the field experience. So, uh, Josh Kunoja actually and uh, Yusuf et al. and reported that beginning of the actual classroom teaching journey, the pre service CFL teachers experienced weakness in their self confidence and lack of knowledge in managing a real class. So it was after actually the, uh, the, the practicum that they exhibited, you know, and uh, stronger uh, self uh, confidence. So, uh, so when it comes to the implications, as I told you, and we, we, we understand the, the importance of teacher education programs and uh, so the, the practicum in teacher education programs and uh, 
Uh, so and in this short period of time, just uh, like just attending, you know, classes for uh, for 12 weeks. So we can uh, indicate, you know, we can see actually how their perception can can positively change. So uh, actually more space and more importance is required to, to be given to teacher education, uh, to the practicum in teacher education programs. Uh, thank you for listening. So I try to just, you know, uh, or, you know skip over uh, the details because of, you know, managing the time more effectively. Uh, thank you for listening. You did a wonderful job. Um, thank you for the presentation. We can take questions. Thank you, John. We can. We still have three minutes um, for the next presentation. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, I would like to ask one question. So was um, because I also work as a supervisor for Particon in Taiwan. I just mm -hmm. wonder for your Particon is that a uh, for whole semester or the whole year? In Turkey, uh, it takes uh, 12 weeks to, uh, you know, just, you know, uh, go to, to attend the class. Actually, it takes a year. In the first semester, the students are expected to observe, uh, to do only observations. And they just go and attend the classes, they observe what happens. But during the second semester, that students are expected to, to, to do some, you know, teaching. I mean, that's the practical side of, uh, you know, uh, the, the practicum in Turkey. So normally it takes a year, but... Uh, particularly, you know, uh, they, they start to, to teach uh, in the second semester. So that continues for 12 weeks. Thank you. You're welcome. And we have another speaker, uh, Zehra Sultan Kubriya Munkaya. And the, present, uh, the title of her presentation will be a case study into EFL instructors' intercultural communicative competence classroom implementations and their background. I actually, uh, personally, I'm also interested in this presentation too much. I am also working in this field. So uh, yes, the floor is yours, uh, Zehra Hoca. We are uh, waiting for you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Zehra Kumriya Mukaya, and I'm an instructor at Turkish Military Academy and an MA student at Gazi University. And my study is a case study about ICC in tertiary level. Uh, my paper is on basic IMRAT structure and um, the terms interconnection, interchange, interaction, and many more uh, having inter in it are both a reason and a result of globalization. And in our globalized world, the interaction among people um, have gone above the borders. And these all lead us to a newer term, intercultural. And intercultural uh, affects many fields from economy to society, and education is one of them. Uh, Byram's intercultural communicative competence has five dimensions, attitude, knowledge, critical cultural awareness, uh, the skills of discovery, and the skills of interpreting and relating. And there are many studies in the field about the significance of ICC and the teachers and instructors believe. And uh, we can see also some studies about implementation, the in-class practice of ICC within the EFL and ESL context. However, uh, there is no study about the background of the in-class implementations, the sources of the teaching ICC. And there is quite a gap between actual cultural teaching practices. And therefore, the purpose of this study is twofold. The first one is uh, to find out tertiary, tertiary level EFL instructors' implementations regarding ICC in their lessons, and to understand the background of those implementations. Um, when we check the literature, uh, we can see that there's a consensus of the importance of ICC. And uh, about the ESL instructors or teachers' beliefs and practices, the studies show that they intrinsically have interest for culture and they have positive expectations. Also, they have high levels of ICC. 
On the other hand, the EFL teacher or instructor's beliefs and practices are seen that um, they're aware of the importance of ICC, but uh, their cultural self-awareness are not seen in their practices. And the context, because the contexts are different, the ESL contexts have different cultures in it. Uh, therefore, automatically, the learners expose, uh, ex are exposed to different cultures, which creates experience of interculturality for them. However, the EFL context, as in Turkey, uh, they share similar cultures, and therefore they have less exposure to different cultures and less experience of interculturality. The studies searching for EFL teachers or instructors practices show that teacher training programs help teaching ICC. And there's a need for pedagogical orientation, teacher training programs, curriculum and exchange programs. Overall, when we look at those studies about teacher, uh, teachers and instructors classroom practices, the studies, um, have the situation in a limited way and they offer only some suggestions like the teacher training programs and workshops, but there is no study on the teachers or instructors background and the background of their teaching ICC. And these are my research questions. Let me give you a couple of seconds to check. Uh, as seen, I will be questioning the beliefs of the instructors and their ICC level and the implementation in class. And the method of the study, the context of the study is the Turkey EFL context and tertiary level, uh, because the Turkey EFL context, uh, as I told you before, has um, have has similar cultures and they have less exposure to different cultures. And uh, the study design is qualitative approach within a case study and eight EFL instructors from a state university in Turkey are involved in this study. And the data collection procedures in, um, include two phases. The first one is background. Uh, in the chart, you can see the background information of the participants. All participants have the same age, as, have the similar age and similar experience. And seven out of eight are either uh, a student or a graduate of BA level. And some of them have been to abroad and some of them have taken courses related to ICC. And the second phase is the qualitative data. For this, a temperature interview was conducted. And uh, the data analysis procedure of the study happened um, through themes because the researcher analyzes the data for specific themes and put the information into large clusters. Therefore, interviews were recorded and transcribed. The recurring ideas in the interviews were noted and the teams were determined and categorized accordingly. And the findings of the study will be given correspondingly to the research questions. The first one is, what are the beliefs of EFL instructors in ICC? Um, according to the study, yes, they are aware of their own, own culture and they have basic knowledge of target culture, uh, which are generally the British and American culture. And they also have basic knowledge of other cultures, but it depends only on their experiences and interests. And all regard themselves interculturally competent, especially better with the familiar cultures. Uh, one participant indicated he or she is, um, he or she knows about German culture because he or she lived in Germany. 
uh, seven out of eight participants indicated that they try to use uh, IC, they try to integrate ICC in their lessons, and they do it via contextualizing the topic, reading text, using their uh, experiences and memories, and using visuals. And how do the FL instructors feel about teaching ICC? They feel confident and competent from relatively to definitely. And they indicated that they feel definitely better with the familiar cultures. And the instructors who definitely feeling confident are the ones who have been abroad. Uh, for example, one participant says, confident, but not too much. And I do my best, but most of the time I feel confident, especially in American and Japanese cultures, because uh, she is familiar of, the, uh, of those cultures. And the background of the instructors ITC comes, comes from the courses they took in BA and MA levels. However, those courses are mostly elective and only one instructor uh, specifically took a course, um, not only Turkish, not only English culture, but also German culture. And other means are abroad experiences and teacher training programs. Again, one only one participant had a teacher training program, but in abroad. And special interests are there uh, another means of gaining knowledge such as movies, documentaries, and books. And uh, the background of their implementation of their in-class practice comes from the courses again. And only one participant indicate, indica, indicated that um, he or she involved in a teacher training program in a course, but it was in abroad again. And the webinars and self-efforts are the other means of teaching ICC. And uh, we have a quote here, which is important. Most of the courses try to teach cultural differences, methodology lessons, especially. In practicum, I did not learn to teach culture. Finally, the um, participants are asked whether they want to have more knowledge about ICC and teaching ICC. All answered yes. And uh, they indicated that it is possible via abroad experiences, teacher training programs, courses in MA and BA levels, and international projects. And those findings lead us to the discussion of the study. First of all, the participants having abroad experience um, use their knowledge, their experiences more in the classroom, uh, and they feel more confident when compared to the ones that, um, who don't have a broad experience. And the courses in BA and MA teach ICC, however, they don't teach teaching ICC. And the aforementioned teacher training programs were only in abroad during the participants' abroad experiences. And it's, it is a sign of the lack of teacher training programs in Turkey, or if they exist, the lack of awareness of those programs. And uh, there are urgent needs for study work, uh, work abroad programs, the courses and teacher training programs. The first one could be uh, demanding because of funding uh, you know, sending each student or each teacher abroad may not be practical. However, the others uh, requires less effort. And if, if we add a course related to ICC to the department, there won't be big change or big effect on the department. And they are easier to arrange and uh, they offer freedom for creation and execution. Finally, the context of EFL and ESL lead us to new terms of EFL culture and ESL culture. Um, here, what is meant is this. The phenomena 
in one culture may mean less or more important for the two different culture types. Um, I can give you an example of fire, for example. Uh, there's a fire in a building in London. This phenomenon uh, may be more important for the people who live in London, who live in London because they have the ESL culture. But uh, this may mean less important to Turkish people, which is an EFL culture. And finally, the limitation of this study is the sample size. A larger sample may lead us to different and broader results, and it may affect the generalizability of the study. And further studies can explore multiple cases, and they can be designed within a mixed method, and they can follow a teacher training program, as it is uh, shown that there's a need for it. And those are my references. And that's all. Thank you for listening to me. It will be an honor um, to answer your questions if you have. Yes. Thank you very much, Zehra Hocam. Thank you. Yes, do we have any questions? Um, hello, everyone. Uh, rather than question, I have some comments. That's a really interesting and very good study. Thank you very much for raising this uh, issue to not only EFL, uh, but also uh, in different branches, teachers need uh, intercultural competence so that uh, we are going to have peaceful world in the future. So uh, teachers, uh, where will the teachers learn? So that's a good question. Uh, in the programs, there should be uh, some kind of courses uh, in order to create awareness. Well, uh, in the faculty of education programs, there is a course which is called uh, Teaching Democracy or Democracy Itime. So maybe it could be included there uh, by talking with the instructors who teach. I don't know. I haven't seen the uh, syllabus of the, those courses because they are taught by 18 preliminary usually. But uh, in our courses as language teachers, we can include and also uh, we can just, you know, share our knowledge that all human beings are human beings, regardless of their gender, belief system, uh, culture, history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Zehra Hocam. Floor is yours. It's your session. Okay, thank you very much. Hello again. Uh, today I will be presenting about incidental vocabulary acquisition in SLA, and we will look at whether oral input uh, facilitates uh, vocabulary acquisition while reading. Uh, welcome to my presentation, and uh, I want to make a brief introduction. As we all know, continuous of vocabulary learning is essential for competence in L2. And all the studies on intentional vocabulary learning uh, have shown that explicit teaching of lexical items result in better acquisition by L2 learners, especially adult L2 learners. Uh, it falls short of explaining the gap between the words that learners learn and uh, teachers to, uh, teach in the classroom environment. Uh, so although it's the ideal one, uh, it's not a realistic objective for EFL teachers. Uh, to explicitly teach all the vocabulary L2 learners need uh, to read authentic materials, which brings the incidental vocabulary acquisition to the foreground. And uh, many studies on incidental vocabulary learning have examined the effects of frequency of exposure, uh, and they also explored input mode, like uh, written input, oral input, or video, pictures, etc. Uh, besides, these studies mostly were mostly conducted with advanced or nearly advanced learners, uh, and they mostly focused on reading skill. However, the research on uh, incidental vocabulary acquisition uh, of learners with low altitude proficiency and the role of uh, simultaneous input modalities are limited in number when we look at the literature. Uh, in addition to my knowledge, there is scarcely any study uh, in Turkish context with Turkish learners. 
Uh, so why do I prefer incidental over implicit in this study? Uh, incidental vocabulary learning refers to learning new lexical items uh, through another activity without any intention or requirement to do so. Uh, although some scholars use these two terms uh, interchangeably, some distinguish between them. Uh, unlike implicit uh, learning, which centers upon the role of consciousness, uh, incidental learning concentrates on the learner intention. Therefore, uh, we can say that incidental vocabulary learning research majorly studies how much learning occurs uh, in conditions where learners do not deliberately focus on vocabulary, but something else. Uh, this was the purpose of my study, actually. And uh, only a few studies investigated the role of input modalities on word learning in L2, and they wanted to unveil the potential impact of each mode. In one of these studies, Kelly in uh, 1992 investigated whether uh, there were differences in word retention uh, in listening while reading a uh, mode as opposed to reading only mode. And he found that visual input uh, resulted in higher scores on immediate tests. However, combining visual and oral input resulted in higher scores when the tests were delayed. So uh, in the late uh, tests, actually, uh, listening while reading group performed better. When we look at Horst and his colleague's study, um, they found that teachers reading aloud and students following the text facilitated incidental vocabulary learning again. Also, Brown uh, and his colleagues in 2005, uh, 2008 uh, expected that audio input could reduce um, could reduce mental resources required for phonological processing in uh, unfamiliar vocabulary, and they thought that it might give room for semantic, uh, semantic processing, but uh, they actually couldn't find any significant differences in incidental vocabulary learning between the reading only and reading while listening group. Finally, uh, Malone uh, conducted a similar study, and he found that uh, simultaneous input modalities fostered deeper processing and successful uh, equalization. Uh, I want to mention about my study, and uh, actually this quasi-experimental study aimed to investigate the impact of simultaneous B-model input uh, on EFL learners' incidental acquisition and also retention of new vocabulary. Uh, there were two groups, a control group, and this group uh, actually was reading on the condition. And uh, I also had an experimental group, uh, which was listening while reading condition. Um, okay. And here, actually, you see the uh, independent and dependent variables. So independent variables were the type of input. It was a written input in reading condition and written and oral input in listening while reading condition. And also the time of the test was uh, another independent variable. The dependent variable was accuracy in word meaning matching tests. And for this purpose, I addressed the four research questions. In the uh, first two questions, uh, I explored the extent uh, to which initial vocabulary learning occurred in reading only condition and in listening while reading condition. In my uh, third research question, I explored the effect of all the enhancement on incidental vocabulary learning while reading. And finally, uh, I looked at uh, to what extent the newly learned words were retained by the control and experimental groups uh, one week after the interventions. And I want to mention about my methodology, and let's start with the participants. Uh, 90 EFL learners with elementary competence, they were um, A2 level students uh, in English. Uh, these students were recruited from four different classes in an intensive English program at the State University I work at. Uh, the study was conducted last academic year and all participants were native speakers of Turkish. Uh, they were learning English as a foreign language. And 33 students uh, completed all sessions of the study and 57 participants were omitted from the study because they couldn't complete uh, at least one of the tasks uh, we conducted. 
And uh, the control group involves 17 participants, while the experimental group involved 16 participants. Uh, what about the materials? Uh, five graded A2 level reading texts with a set of uh, 15 target words were selected from different EFL course books for the study. Uh, because the, Asia, uh, the major aim of the study was to uh, determine the average number of the words that L2 students could learn and recall uh, in reading classes without being exposed to any direct vocabulary teaching. Naturalistic materials were uh, preferred, they were favored over uh, experimental or modified materials. And uh, participants encountered uh, target vocabulary through uh, reading five different texts, as I, uh, as I have already mentioned, and each text contained five uh, target words. I can say that each uh, word were presented two or three times in reading text, and the texts were similar in length. When you see the, when you look at the number of the words, you will see that they were similar in length. And measures. Uh, the same 25 question items were used to measure participants' lexical knowledge before, immediately after, and a week after the treatments. Uh, the tests were um, accessed, actually, through a link which was sent uh, to all participants. Uh, because uh, the four meaning connections were selected as the baseline, participants' knowledge of the target words uh, was measured through meaning to word uh, matching questions and the questions on the test were in multiple choice format and students uh, answered 25 vocabulary questions in total and they were asked to choose the best option the correct meaning for the target word among five uh, other options in each question and procedure uh, before treatments, participants' prior knowledge of the target words uh, was assessed via an online protest, as you see here. One week after the protest, uh, I started the treatment sessions with uh, both groups, and during the interventions, participants in the control group only read the text, and participants in the experimental group uh, read the text while they were simultaneously listening to the audio recording of it. And uh, to have a control over the exposure time, uh, it was very important because I was you know, assessing implicit uh, learning. That's why I tried to control the exposure time and also uh, to prevent students focusing on target words. Reading texts were presented on timed PowerPoint slides and students read only two or three sentences depending on the length of the sentence on the screen. Uh, a blank slide was added after each slide so the students and teacher, uh, researcher, me, uh, could discuss the reading text. Uh, they couldn't go back to the previous slide, they couldn't reread the text, and uh, no questions, of course, about vocabulary were allowed. And after each treatment session, uh, participants uh, completed an online test. Uh, it was the immediate post-test. In the immediate post-test, the questions um, that were asked in the pre-test were embedded, uh, embedded uh, in uh, reading comprehension questions uh, that students studied. And participants' answers to comprehension questions, of course, were not included in the analysis. Uh, we had a purpose for this. The main reason was that uh, we wanted part, um, the main reason uh, that we want participants answering both uh, comprehension and vocabulary questions was to ensure that they didn't realize the actual purpose of the uh, study and uh, pay deliberate attention on vocabulary, especially during the following treatment sessions. And the same procedure was followed uh, in the next uh, treatment sessions. And uh, the scores that uh, participants got from uh, five uh, immediate posts were uh, actually uh, brought together and they constituted their immediate test uh, scores. Finally, uh, they took, participants took a delayed post test online after a week and the test items in each administration were exactly the same. And 
uh, students' responses to multiple choice items in the word uh, meaning matching tests were coded for accuracy. Uh, they got either one uh, or uh, zero uh, for their correct and incorrect uh, answers. And uh, as the researcher, I scored the tests and uh, the SPSS software was utilized to conduct uh, descriptive analysis and calculate the means and percentages for uh, lexical gains of participants. Let's look at the results and discussions. Uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, the first research question aimed to investigate incidental vocabulary gain of the reading on the group, uh, of the control group, and to answer the question, a descriptive analysis was employed. And in the table you see here, um, actually the uh, mean and standard deviations are presented. And uh, you see the data for pretest and immediate post test results. Uh, the mean scores uh, for pretest and immediate post test were 11.23 and 16.76, respectively. And these findings showed us that without being exposed to any deliberate vocabulary instruction, uh, five point, uh, 53 words were learned uh, actually were learned um, by the learners. And uh, it was a gain of more than uh, 49%. Uh, and these findings are compatible with prior research that uh, provides evidence for the value of reading in incidental vocabulary learning. We can say that reading alone seems to provide EFL learners with the input they need to acquire new vocabulary without any deliberate uh, you know, effort or intention. It, even a small number of exposure, as you see here, it was just two or three uh, times, um, it facilitated incidental vocabulary acquisition. Research question two aimed to examine incidental vocabulary learning in an experimental group in listening while reading mode. And mean scores of pretest and immediate post test results of the experimental group were calculated through descriptive analysis again. And as the table uh, demonstrates, the mean scores were uh, 10.25 for pretest and 16.62 for immediate post test. And these findings revealed that written input uh, enhanced with oral input resulted in a gain, in a gain of uh, 6.37 words on average. And it was like a gain of uh, more than, you know, 60%. And these findings again uh, revealed um, uh, similar findings with previous studies, uh, for example, with the study of Malone uh, and Horst and his colleagues, uh, and it demonstrated that oral enhancement of written input facilitated success in incidental vocabulary learning. And uh, research question three, uh, it aimed to compare the two groups in terms of their incidental vocabulary acquisition in L2 and uh, examine the effects of simultaneous input modalities on acquisition rate. And findings show that the control group uh, scored relatively higher than the experimental group in the pretest, as you see here. Immediate post-test results of the two groups, on the other hand, were very close to each other. And the mean scores for the multiple choice tests were 16.76 for reading on the group and 16.62 for a listening while reading group. And these findings revealed uh, that oral plus written input influenced incidental uh, vocabulary learning through reading. And although not very powerful, uh, it provided an advantage for, for the experimental group. Uh, and here again, you can see the graphical presentation of the data. Uh, here you can see the pretest and immediate post test results for reading only and listening while reading mode. Uh, these findings again uh, are, um, these findings align with the results of previous studies that found some effects of oral enhancement in four meaning connections. Uh, finally, uh, the last research question aimed to examine the rate of vocabulary retained by, uh, by the two groups one week after completing the treatments. An immediate post-test and late post-test results for both groups are presented here. As you see, the control group outperformed the experimental group, uh, as you can see here. 
And um, results, results showed an impressive rate of retention of the birds uh, in reading on the condition. There were no significant uh, forgetting after one week and participants uh, learned the words and they, re uh, they remembered them. Uh, and uh, the multiple choice immediate post-test and the light post uh, delayed post-test uh, measures revealed reasonably good memory for listening while reading group. Um, it was, you know, standing at uh, more than 80%. However, uh, compared to reading on the group, listening while reading groups data showed some decay from initial learning, which was a loss of 3.25 first. And we can say that uh, these findings actually showed us that words learned incidentally by reading were more resistant to decay than words learned uh, through listening while reading. Here again, you can see the um, figure that summarizes the findings for pre-test, immediate post-test, and delayed post-test for both groups. Uh, I want to uh, tell about my implications. Uh, these findings, of course, have several important implications for EFL classrooms. Uh, first of all, uh, this study provides evidence that EFL learners can learn some new vocabulary through reading and they can retain it over a week without any deliberate attention or intention, uh, neither by the teacher or students themselves. And it points to the importance of reading. Uh, maybe it points to the uh, importance of extensive reading in our two lexical development. Uh, therefore, uh, VELT teachers should expose our students to reading input as much as possible in our classrooms. Secondly, the study shows that providing more than one input simultaneously uh, doesn't seem to significantly affect the incidental out of vocabulary learning. Thus, uh, learners need some deliberate uh, word-focused instruction following the initial exposures uh, to permanently learn these words. Finally, uh, instead of exposing our two learners to, to simultaneous input modalities, maybe it, uh, it will be more effective for teachers to increase the frequency of encounters to new words in reading texts. Here you can see my uh, references and I'm not sure uh, whether if I have enough time, but if you have any questions, you can find me at this email address or you can use chat box. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for listening then. Thank you for being with us today, Hojam, and for your contributions to our conference. So... Our speaker is Marcin Stanowski. And the title is Teacher, What is Your Bias? The screen is all yours. I, I do apologize for, for um, uh, being late. Now, guys, um, my name is Marcin Stanowski, and uh, I'm a representative of ITEFL Poland. Um, uh, at my organization, I'm uh, responsible for coordinating global issues, especially interest group. And that's why most of my topics, most of my uh, talks, are about um, global issues or about um, the relationship of a student and a teacher and also the, the meaning of education. Today, I would like to um, take you to the story of the bias. And we are people, and people do have biases. So I'm asking you, teacher, what is your bias? Um, I would like to um, ask you to um, enjoy uh, um, a story. Well, enjoy is a kind of a difficult um, um, word here, but I'll just let me tell you something. A father and a son were involved in a car accident in which the father was killed, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid and the son was injured. The father um, was, of course, pronounced dead on the spot, on the scene, um, and the son was taken to uh, the hospital by ambulance. Now, uh, in the operating room, a surgeon was called, and when the surgeon saw the patient, the surgeon shouted, oh my God, 
It's my son. Could you please explain this to me? How it is possible? How the surgeon could see a son in this patient? Let me just take a look at the chat. Yeah, of course, his mother was the surgeon. But you know what? It's uh, not very common answer. Uh, when I was telling this story to my students, they were absolutely shocked because they couldn't understand how father could be both uh, dead and a surgeon. And that little story shows us that we are biased in a very natural way. And our biases affect our actions, affect our teaching as well. Let me now um, take you once again into a little experiment. And I would like you to think about some connotations that you have with those words that you will see in the, um, in the screen, okay? So the first one is like this. Can you think about some association, mental association uh, about that? I'm not asking you to, to, to tell me that, but just think about, is it positive or is it negative? Usually uh, biases or prejudices or stereotypes have this um, extreme uh, expressions that we usually, if we think about the biases, we always use always, never, for sure, 100%. And we know that every generalization is dangerous. Or let me take you to this thing. Are there any stereotypes uh, connected with the color of hair? Well, that may be that a teacher um, treats unfairly a student because of the color of hand and how ridiculous it is that also uh, sometimes happens. And um, for example, young people, I just, before our session, I had the lesson with a lovely bunch of, of students and I asked them, what do you think? What is the um, older generation's um, image of you guys, people? And they said, well, very often um, our teachers think that we know nothing, that we are not um, adapted, we, that we cannot do, we, that we are not dealing very well at, at the society. And is that true? I mean, were we better when we were younger? That's a matter of a question or maybe a research. That's why I'm asking us and asking you, teacher, What's your bias? If you look at those two girls, which one will you treat uh, with uh, more respect? Which one will you treat um, as a valuable member of a class? And actually, this is a research from 2006 from a Warsaw Psychological uh, University. And that was a part of research. Teachers in Poland were showed to uh, students and were asked to rate which of them is more valuable a student. And probably, yeah, you can expect that the student on the right with glasses, with the neat hairstyle was considered more valuable. Uh, however, both of these girls, actually, this is only one, this is, the, this is the one girl, right? But her looks is different. And the research showed that uh, teachers would be more eager to uh, rate highly um, the, the student who's neat and, and uh, with a um, white collar and the glasses and a nice neat uh, hairstyle. And of course, that all uh, brings us to how it affects our uh, students. 
And probably are aware of uh, the Rosenthal effect or Pygmalion effect. And that was the uh, result, result, re research of um, Jacobson and Rosenthal uh, in the 60s of the, of the previous century. And uh, if, if, if you don't remember what it was about, I'll just kind of give you a, a short a brief um, uh, short about that. Um, some students were randomly were considered of high intelligence, and uh, that was the information for a teacher who was teaching them. Um, was thought to be or was well regarded as a below the average of intelligence, and as you may expect at the end of the school year those students who were deemed not intelligent achieved far uh, lower um, results which are based on our bias influence our students think highly of ours of, of your students and then they will achieve a lot, a lot uh, more. This is the lesson from the um, experiment. And you know what? I've got um, a lot of myself uh, biases. Uh, and also I collected some biases from my colleagues and from my students. And I would like to uh, kind of present some of them to you. For example, you may not believe me, but up to uh, 20 years of age, I really thought that anybody who can speak when I went to Great Britain and I faced the reality, I understood that I was wrong. But because I was taught English at school and because I, um, I heard people speaking English in the radio, or I saw uh, English speakers in the TV or in the films, I automatically assumed that they are smarter, which is of course not the case. Well, another um, bias, which is quite um, typical to many, many teachers, that some class are simply unteachable or even um, I admit it with, with great sadness that some teachers would also call the students' names. They would enter the staff room and they would say, oh, this is simply unfair. And what's more, this is ineffectious. Because Russia comes just after the college to a, a school. And the first thing that he, he is informed of our uh, biases. And this is something to avoid. <clears throat> Let me tell you about another thing, other things, 11 million, 11 million of uh, information, bits of information, and our brain can only process 50 bits of, of information. Um, that's why our um, brain creates shortcuts, creates some automatic um, schemata, which make us uh, more economical with the information, right? And this is basically um, which, which, which happens to everybody. Well, why bias matters? Because the injustice matters. Uh, is it uh, fair to um, treat other people and rate other people and affect their education um, for example, like this, is it okay to give a student lower grade solely because they're overweight? Or 
to treat the same people different ways because of their clothing, or to call on boys more often than girls when they raise their hands at school, or for male teachers to receive positive evaluations rather than their female colleagues. And the truth must said, the truth must be said that, um, well, male teachers, I don't know how it is in Turkey, but uh, um, male teachers tend to have, well, smooth sailing, a plain sailing uh, in education, because we simply do not have that many of them, right? Uh, and is it fair? Well, it's not. Um, now, I would like to remember that teacher expectations predict the student's uh, performance. And um, since biases are based on selective uh, data, so the um, clue is to know more. Know more, understand more, recognize, act on it, speak up against, replace negative stereotypes, and commit to assessment um, criteria. For example, how to know more about your students? Well, take care of the relationship, ask them questions, collect as much as possible information, make use of parent teaching meetings, and of course, practice empathy. So take time to um, address students, but also to listen to them and hear about their problems. And I know that when we are focused on teaching of a subject, sometimes we may lose this, this, uh, this partnership, this relationship. But if we do not invest our time in it, we'll simply um, grow our biases. Let me give you another awareness activity, uh, which I'll also do with my students. And this is about um, um, boarding a train. Imagine that you're boarding a train, a train about to make a three-hour journey. The train is crowded with only a few seats, uh, unoccupied, no chance of sitting on your own. And now think about which seat would you choose? Which seat would you take basing on your, on your, I understand that five minutes, right? Yeah, cool. And which seat would you, would you, would you take? Would you sit next to a young man who's wearing trash metal t-shirts and a large pair of headphones? And uh, maybe you would take a seat um, uh, in a group of four, the other seats are occupied by young women of African origin who are clearly traveling together. And such activities, when you confront students, well, in English, of course, when you confront students with some practical situations in which you show how their choices are affected by their prejudices, such uh, activities have an important, not only communication value in an English language classroom, but also a very important psychological um, factor. Now, you may also um, read more about biases at such a web, web page. And what I usually do, I ask my students to uh, do some project based on your bias is, I refer them to this, um, uh, to this web page and ask them to do the presentations. This way, I ask them to familiarize themselves with, uh, with the problem and pay attention to such things. You may also, as a teacher, but also you can also ask uh, uh, students to do that, you can also uh, join uh, Harvard uh, and Project Implicit, uh, in which you can do online tests which show you, which will show you with some degree of certainty if you are biased and against what you are biased. Of course, later on I will make the slides available so you could spread it and you could inform other people. Now, an important element of bias is the bias in grading. 
And uh, that's why I mentioned that you need to conform to grading criteria. Because has it ever happened to you that you overestimated a student's likely performance, having first considered a large number of students who are all at much, much lower standard? And this is basically the contrast effect, right? If you uh, listen to a student who is very uh, low and then listen to a student who is very high at English, well, that could affect your grading. Or, for example, did you give a student a better grade because of he is, uh, well, somehow uh, respected by other uh, teachers at school? This is the conformity bias. Or maybe you have ever given a better grade to a student who you like or they resemble you some way or another. And this is the affinity bias. So basically, uh, not only making students aware, but uh, standards and criteria are very important. When it comes to testing, uh, a, a tool which is quite good is blindfold tests. Um, you mean like your, your students don't put their, their own names on the test, but they code it. Okay. I'm not saying that it's like it must be a steady procedure, but you may have fun with it. Okay. So you ask your students to code uh, their names onto the uh, tests for essays. And this way, you evaluate, you grade the test or the essay more fairly because you don't know who has written it. You simply are more objective. And basically, this is uh, what we want to um, achieve. And this is something that we want to avoid, right? Okay. Um, a final thought, thought for today is that uh, when you apply the anti-bias training to your students and to yourself, you may achieve much, much more. And your students will simply um, believe more in them if you believe in them as well, okay? And the same is about you and your principles. If your principal will think that you will do something, you will be able to do it. Thank you very much. And think Thank about you. it. Keep Thank you. What is your bias? Yes, we will definitely. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a very informative and inspiring session. Hey.